Tonight, the Democratic ticket is complete, and now the tickets of the two major parties of the United States are complete. The battle lines are drawn. I would like to ask our guest commentators to comment on those two tickets. Our commentators, of course, are Gore Vidal, author, playwright, a noted liberal, and William Buckley, editor, one-time New York mayoral candidate, a noted conservative. You're first tonight, Mr. Buckley. Can you compare or comment on these two tickets that will face one another in November? Uh, <clears throat> sure. I think what I'd like to say most about um, the Democratic ticket is the, the occurrence today to which I attack, uh, attach uh, the greatest significance, uh, which is the statement by Senator McCarthy that he will refuse to endorse that ticket. Uh, under certain circumstances, I don't think that would mean very much. Uh, we've had uh, political quarrels in the past uh, uh, after a resolution of which an individual said I'm wrong for whatever reason. But the reason I think it is especially important um, here today uh, is because uh, there is a congruity but this, between this show of personal uh, independence uh, and a sense which I think has been encouraged among certain Democrats, largely younger Democrats, of total independence from any kind of authority, from any kind of identification with the decision of a majority within their own party. Now, I understand very well the role of private moral authority. An individual should decide for himself whether he will back any ticket or not. But it is moral philosophers, I think, rather than public men who necessarily uh, illustrate that particular imperative. So I predict that Senator McCarthy's refusal to go along is going to have a disintegrative effect not merely on the Democratic Party, which is a Republican, uh, doesn't concern me greatly, but also uh, on the whole notion of what it is that you need to keep civic union working. Mr. Vidal, what do you think about that McCarthy statement? Do you think that it's as serious as that, too? Is the Democratic Party, for the first time, going to have a fight and not unite after the fight? Well, I think, it's, I think it is quite serious. I don't see the party uniting as it was, say, four years ago, which that was rather an unusual victory and rather an unusual consensus, as Lyndon Johnson would say. No, I, I'm not quite sure to the extent that Senator McCarthy will be fact. I talked to him this afternoon, as a matter of fact, about half an hour, and his mood was extraordinarily serene and untroubled. Uh, I think he was uh, waiting to see, really, what uh, how Hubert Humphrey will behave about the war, what the campaign will look like. Meanwhile, he said that he would campaign vigorously for certain senators on the grounds that it was, after all, it was the Roman Senate that had saved that republic, so maybe this Senate will save our republic. And uh, I don't know to the, what extent I think there will be a fourth party movement, in a sense, balancing on the left what George Wallace is doing on the right. I think this is apt to come about in the next few weeks. I think there may be even a tendency to try and put Senator McCarthy's name on a, on a fourth party ballot line in at least 25 states. You think he would agree? Uh, his attitude is wherever he could take himself off legally, he would feel obligated to do so. He is still a member of the Democratic Party. Where he was not obligated to take it off by law, there's nothing that he could do about it. That means that you could, in effect, put his name up or anybody's name. And uh, in certain states, uh, whether the man himself wants to run or not is irrelevant. So I see a great split occurring, and I would agree with Mr. Buckley to this extent, that I'm almost absolutely convinced that Richard Nixon will win the election. Well, now, can you compare the tickets? We know that the Democrats are now in a weak position. Can you compare the individuals uh, as campaigners, Humphrey and Nixon? Can you comment on that, Mr. Buckley? I think they're, they're both uh, vigorous campaigners. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Humphrey uh, suffers from certain of the disadvantages that Mr. Nixon suffered under in 1960, namely uh, the inevitable number two-ness of the image, considering the fact that he continues to be an active vice president. It would seem to be in that connection that Mr. Humphrey would have very little to lose, but a continuous gain if he were to resign uh, as vice president on the grounds of the uh, uh, explicit uh, uh, incompatibility of the two assignments. In point of fact, I don't see why that isn't uh, accepted as a matter of national protocol, that on the one hand it is impossible to be totally subservient, 
as a practice requires you to be, to a president whom you serve as vice president, on the other hand, to strike out uh, and establish uh, an independent uh, uh, image of your own of a kind that you are attempting to sell to the body of the people. So he has this disadvantage. Mr. Nixon doesn't have that disadvantage at this point. Uh, he is proceeding, I think, uh, surely, optimistically, not, in my judgment, uh, taking uh, advantage of any of the major lesions of the Democratic Party. And under the circumstances, I think that indirectly, he comes out at this moment very strong. Can you see any, uh, people say quite often, and I think they may be right, that this election may not be decided by the circumstances we see now. They may be decided by events in the world that happened between now and November. Can you see any events, Mr. Vidal, that would change, uh, change this trend you're talking about, that, that well, Nixon's likely to win? I think if there were suddenly some extraordinary good news uh, from Southeast Asia, uh, such as uh, a peace treaty or a complete cooling off of the war, which might then get back the peace party or parties, which would fragment off, I think that would be very helpful to the Democratic candidate. Uh, conversely, if there's a great deal, any more trouble in the cities of the sort that we've seen here in Chicago, I think that this will probably act against the Democrats and will be extremely useful for the Republicans. All they have to do is sit by and uh, let the cities blow up and look as though they might be able to handle it. Uh, they really have a perfectly splendid year ahead of them. I, uh, <clears throat> I was the moderator in the first Kennedy-Nixon debate, and I, uh, I hope there's going to be a debate between these two highly articulate men. Mr. Buckley, you have a way with words. Which of the two do you think would be the better debater, handle himself better in a debate? Well, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Humphrey is more mellifluous uh, than Mr. Nixon, but this may not be a time for uh, mellifluity. He, uh, Mr. Humphrey, you may notice when he's in a jam, is always extending uh, his heart. Uh, to whoever's in, in, in trouble. Uh, he's either doing that or, or, or dropping bombs on, on, on people, or, or, or at, least to say, uh, at least justifying the, the doing of that, as, as he does in, in Vietnam, I think with some uh, justification. Uh, he is, I think, uh, smoother than Mr. Nixon. Mr. Nixon, on the other hand, has, uh, I think, a quality of, uh, of gravity which uh, alienates some people, but doesn't alienate all people. On the contrary, there are times when gravity is very much uh, in order. Concerning sheer intellectual competence, uh, I think both of them are highly qualified. And uh, concerning a nature, uh, a quality of apprehending and integrating what it is, what the movements are in political life, Nixon comes out ahead, and that you may discover this if you moderate the next one. What do you think, Mr. Vidal, about the ability of the two men to handle issues in public in contest with one another? Well, no reflection, Mr. Smith, upon your first debate, which I remember very well, between Kennedy and Nixon. But I think these great debates are absolutely nonsense. Uh, the way they're set up, there's almost no interchange of ideas, very little even of personality. If we remember, everybody decided that Nixon looked rather disagreeable, that Kennedy didn't look as young as they'd been told, he looked much solider, he seemed to have a nicer smile. It was much more, it's too frivolous. There's also the terrible thing about this medium that hardly anyone listens. They sort of get an impression of somebody and they think that they figure, figure out just what he's like by seeing him on television. This would mean that you might have the most disastrous man in the country, who happened to be a good television performer, and he could beat, let us say, Senator Taft, a virtuous man of no great telegenic charm. Uh, so all in all, if I, may, I hate to suddenly come out against the idea of debate in our lives, but the way they are now set up on television, I, I don't think I'd even bother to watch this one. You